I've been a park ranger in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park for over 12 years now, and I've seen a lot of strange things. I'm Cherokee, born and raised in the shadow of these ancient mountains, and the stories passed down through my family's generations have always been filled with caution. But when you grow up surrounded by the myths and folklore of your ancestors, you develop a healthy skepticism. At least, I used to have one. I'm not sure if it's the land itself or something that was here long before we ever called it home, but the Smokies, they don't like people. They don't want us here. And I think they're starting to show it. It started with the hikers. I've seen many people go missing over the years. You might think it's easy to get lost out here dense forests, steep cliffs, unpredictable weather. It's a dangerous place for the unprepared. But this was different. They weren't getting lost, they were vanishing. The first one was a solo backpacker, a guy in his early 20s, fresh out of college. He came into the visitor center, all smiles, eager to conquer the park's more challenging trails. Three days later, he was supposed to check back in at a ranger station. He never did. We searched for him for weeks. Dogs, helicopters, volunteers, nothing. Not a single trace. No gear, no clothing, not even a footprint. It was as if the mountain had swallowed him whole. Then it was the family. A father, mother, and two kids. They were hiking a popular trail, one of the easier ones. I'd seen them earlier that morning, and they looked happy, enjoying their time together. By that afternoon, only the father stumbled out of the forest, bloodied and delirious. He couldn't remember what had happened. Said they'd heard something strange, a low hum, like a deep vibration coming from the woods. Then his family was just... gone. We searched the area where they disappeared, but we couldn't find them. The father's mind broke after that. He hasn't spoken since. That's when I started hearing it too. At first, it was just whispers soft, unintelligible murmurs carried on the wind, almost like the forest was speaking to itself. I thought it was just the isolation, the hours spent alone in the woods playing tricks on me. But then it became clearer. They know my name. It always starts around dusk when the shadows begin to stretch across the trails and the forest takes on an eerie stillness. I'll be walking my rounds, checking on campsites when I'll hear it. Faint at first like someone calling out from a distance. But it's not a voice I recognize, and it never comes from the same direction. One night, I was checking a remote area when I heard it clear as day, a woman's voice, soft and beckoning. Come here, Daniel. I froze. I hadn't told anyone I was working that part of the park that night. My radio was silent, no one around for miles. I called out, thinking maybe it was a lost hiker. But no one answered. Then the whisper came again, this time closer. Daniel, come to me. I knew better than to follow it, but something inside me pulled toward the sound. It wasn't curiosity. It was primal, like a tug deep in my chest, an ancient call my ancestors had warned me about. The next day, I went to visit my grandmother. She's one of the few elders left in our family, a medicine woman, someone who's seen more than she lets on. When I told her about the voice, her face darkened, and she pulled me close, whispering the old stories I hadn't heard since childhood. There's something in the Smokies, something old and hungry. The Cherokee have always known this, she said. We call it Uctina, the horned serpent, a creature of unimaginable power and evil, but it's more than that. The mountains are its domain, and we are trespassers. It lives in the unseen spaces, between the trees, under the rocks, in the fog that rolls down from the peaks at dawn. It waits, watching, luring the curious and the foolish into its grasp. The voices, she said, are only the beginning. Once you hear them, it's already too late. Uctina has marked you. I thought she was just trying to scare me, but after what happened last week, I know she's right. A group of seasoned campers, people who knew the land well, went missing near Klingman's Dome. This time, I was the one leading the search. We found their campsite, but it was all wrong. Their tents were torn apart, not by animals or weather, but as if something had shredded them from the inside. There were no tracks, no blood, no signs of struggle, just an overwhelming sense of dread that hung in the air like a thick fog. I felt it, deep in my bones. Uctina had been here. That night, as I sat alone in my cabin, I heard it again. The voice. But this time, it was inside. Right behind me. Daniel, come to me. 
I didn't turn around. I couldn't. The air in the room became oppressive, thick with the weight of something I couldn't see but knew was there. My hand shook as I reached for the medicine pouch my grandmother had given me. It was the only thing that kept the presence at bay. I haven't slept since. Now, every time I walk the trails, I feel it watching me. The whispers have grown louder, more insistent. They want me to come to them. The Smokies aren't just a place they're alive, and they're hungry. The land is angry, and it's starting to take back what was stolen from it. The disappearances, the voices, they're only the beginning. If you value your life, stay far away from the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Because once the mountains call your name, there's no escaping them. I had been working at the Greywood National Park for 10 years. I loved my job and the serenity that the park offered. The sound of birds whispering and chirping about their day filled my head as I watched the sun rise over the mountains and turn the pink clouds into a brilliant orange. Also, I knew every inch of the park like the back of my hand. As a park ranger, I've seen and heard a lot of strange things over the years. Some of them are hard to explain, and others are downright spooky. But it's all part of the job, and I've learned to take it in stride. One of the strangest stories I've heard happened a few years ago. A group of hikers had gone missing in the woods, and we launched a massive search and rescue operation. We combed the forest for days, but we couldn't find any trace of them. It was like they had vanished into thin air. Then, a week later, one of the hikers stumbled out of the woods. He was disoriented and confused, and he kept muttering about how the forest had swallowed them up. We took him to the hospital, and he eventually recovered, but he never spoke about what had happened in the woods. Another odd occurrence happened when a group of campers reported seeing strange lights in the sky. They described them as bright orbs that seemed to move in a pattern. We investigated, but we couldn't find any evidence of a UFO or anything like that. But the campers were so convinced that they had seen something otherworldly that they refused to stay in the park any longer. However, there was one area that I always avoided the whispering woods, a dense and dark part of the forest where people claimed to hear strange whispers at night. It was a patch of forest where the trees grew close together and tangled branches blocked out most of the light from the moon. The canopy was so thick that it housed a complete layer of epiphytes, plants that grow in trees but never touch the ground. In some places hanging vines stretched from tree to tree and gave a glimpse through the treetops, like ropes holding an invisible net up high. I hated to think about what might be lurking in the dark there. Some said it was ghosts whispering, while others said it was the restless spirits of trees that had been felled in a great storm many years ago. Whatever the case, I never went near it. One day, I was on my routine patrol in the drizzly, foggy forest. The musty scent of old leaves and damp soil leaked into the air as I brushed past the nameless trees. A low droning grew louder, and I spotted a silhouette through the mist. It took me several moments to adjust my vision and make out that it was an elk. Suddenly, I came across a group of terrified hikers. They were huddled together, their faces were pale, and their eyes wide with fear. They were trembling and clutching at each other, their bodies tense and braced as if expecting an attack. Their clothes were disheveled and streaked with dirt and sweat, and their breathing was shallow and rapid. They claimed that they had ventured into the whispering woods and had heard eerie voices, urging them to go deeper into the forest. The hikers had barely made it out, and their pale faces were enough for me to take their claims seriously. Officer, thank goodness you're here. We heard these strange voices in the woods, and we don't know what to do, he said, his voice quivering with fear. I nodded, trying to calm them down. Can you tell me more about the voices you heard? Another hiker, a woman with short, curly hair, spoke up. They were like whispers, you know? But they were so clear and they seemed to be coming from all around us. We couldn't understand what they were saying, but it was like they were urging us to go deeper into the woods. I frowned, taking mental notes. Did you see anything unusual in the forest? The hikers shook their heads in unison. No, nothing. But the trees seemed to be closing in on us, and we felt like we were being watched, said another hiker, a young man with a backpack. I scanned the area, looking for any signs of danger. All right, just follow the path and leave the woods for now, 
I said, and the group did so. As the sun began to set, I decided to investigate the woods and put an end to this mystery. I ventured into the forest with a flashlight and walkie-talkie in hand. The sun's light peeked through the canopy of trees, barely touching the ground and leaving everything in a deep shade. The shadows stretched out like tendrils, reaching into the distance. Mist loomed in the air, making the trees seem bigger and more imposing. The wind picked up, howling softly and rustling the leaves of the trees as if beckoning me forward. A strange stillness hung in the air, as if something hidden waited in the shadows. In the distance, I heard faint whispers barely audible on the wind. As I was getting deeper, the air became colder and I tried to ignore the chill that ran down my spine. Then I stopped in the middle of a small clearing and started to listen. The place was bathed in a deep and eerie darkness, the moonlight filtering in through the canopy of trees. The shadows of the trees stretched out like tendrils, reaching deep into the darkness. The mist loomed in the air, making the trees seem bigger and more imposing. The ground was damp and muddy, littered with pine needles and fallen branches. A hush crept through the night air, interrupted only by the soft chirping of crickets and the occasional croak of a frog. The breeze rustled through the leaves of the surrounding trees, and an owl hooted in the distance. Then I started hearing them. But they did not come from the forest, they were in my head. They were low, almost inaudible, yet highly unsettling. It's as if a thousand tiny voices were speaking at once, but all at once. Every syllable was whispered in an otherworldly tongue, full of unknown sounds and unfamiliar syllables. It felt like a cacophony of unearthly sounds that reverberated through my mind. Then I could make out a sentence. Go away! As I stood there, the ominous tone of the words sent an immediate shiver down my spine. It felt like someone or something was warning me of an impending danger, and my mind quickly processed the potential risks of staying in the area any longer. Without a moment's hesitation, I turned on my heels and ran away, out from the forest. Adrenaline coursed through my veins, fueling my quick escape as every step felt like a matter of life or death. I could sense the presence of an unseen danger lurking in the shadows, and my heart raced with every passing moment. The dense underbrush and tangled branches seemed to conspire against me, but I pushed on, fighting my way through the obstacles in my path. My breathing became ragged, and my heart beat faster and louder as I ran for my life. Finally, I emerged from the forest, gasping for breath, and I realized that my whole body was trembling with fear. The warning had been too intense to ignore, and I was grateful that I had heeded it. I took a moment to collect myself and to calm my racing thoughts, trying to make sense of what had just happened in the depths of the foreboding forest. What the hell was it? I muttered to myself in the comforting safety of my car while driving home 20 miles away. When I returned home, no matter how hard I tried, the memory of the foreboding whispers still lingered in my mind. Those voices were enough to keep me awake late into the night, my thoughts filled with dread and confusion as to what had happened in the forest. I decided to research the area in an effort to uncover the source of the mysterious whispers. I scoured historic records and digital newspaper clippings, hoping to find some evidence of what could have been lurking in that forest. What I found were only reports of people hearing the whispers. Also, I did find news articles with evidence of disappearances and strange sightings, but I was not sure if they were relevant or not. The thing is, those reports were from different parts of the forest each year. I was looking for a pattern, but there was nothing that could explain what had caused those whispers. Although I didn't discover any conclusive explanation for the phenomenon I heard in the forest that night, I could say with certainty that there was something strange lurking beneath its surface. I did not understand it yet. The next day, I was so scared that I called in sick to work. I needed a rest to put myself together and process the events of the previous night. I looked out of the window. The sky was a deep shade of gray, with heavy clouds that blotted out the sun and concealed any hint of blue in their shadows. Rain poured down in sheets, puddles forming in low-lying areas and overflowing into the streets. The world outside was blurry and distorted an endless landscape of gray and mist. The rain tapped heavily outside like a symphony of drums, creating a mesmerizing rhythm. The windows were blurred with droplets, creating a static soundtrack from the raindrops hitting the glass. 
The wind whipped through the trees, and the thunder rumbled like waves crashing against the shore, and the lightning flashed briefly like an explosion of light. I reclined on my couch and listened to the raindrops, but a few minutes later, I turned on the television. Soon, a report about a forest came up as the news of the day. Huge rocks, trees, and debris were strewn across the land. The force of the landslide had upturned the entire terrain, leaving a mangled mess that stretched for miles. Heavy boulders have come crashing down from the mountain, and there is destruction everywhere. Huge cracks had formed in the ground and deep ravines had been created as far as the eye could see. Pools of muddy water reflected the dull sky, and a thick haze hung in the air. Then I realized it was the forest, where I had been working for years. The forest was completely destroyed by a landslide. Good morning. We begin this morning with a breaking news story. A massive landslide has struck Greywood National Park, causing extensive damage and destruction. The reporter said. People were walking around, carrying equipment and searching for survivors. The landslide occurred early this morning, and it has completely destroyed the park. There are no reported fatalities at this time, but many people are missing. The cause of the landslide is currently unknown, but officials say that recent heavy rainfall may have played a role. The park was a popular destination for hikers, nature enthusiasts, and tourists. It is estimated that millions of dollars in damage have been done to the park's infrastructure and facilities. This is a tragedy. The National Park Forest was a place of natural beauty, and now it's gone. I can't believe it, a local resident said to the reporter. Recovery efforts are underway, and emergency services are on the scene. However, the park is expected to remain closed for an indefinite period. Our thoughts are with those who have been affected by this disaster. The reporter finished his news report. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, and my jaw hung open in disbelief. Suddenly, everything clicked into place. The whispers were not meant to cause harm. They had been trying to warn us all this time. The forest seemed to know its death was coming. When I was younger, my uncle used to take me with on the quad with him at night to go collect the camera traps he had placed around the woods. One night the quad stalled, and it wasn't until the engine died that we could hear the snapping of sticks and shuffling through leaves all around us. My uncle shined his flashlight to reveal what felt like a thousand sets of eyes staring at us just beyond the darkness, pulled out his pistol, shot at the ground about three feet in front of the closest coyote, and they all went running. He then gave the manliest pull of a pull cord I have ever seen to start the quad, and we noped right the hell out of there. I backpack a lot. My wife and I came over a ridge and Whitkin 20 feet off a pack of wild boars. Stopped dead in our tracks. A few came towards us and started grunting. There was a tree line about 20 feet behind us. I told my wife to get into a tree. I told her, once she was in the tree, I'd follow her. I knew there was no way I'd make it to the trees. I honestly didn't think I'd survive. Wild boar are way more dangerous than bear or big cats. Once she was in the tree, I slowly took off my backpack and laid it on the ground hoping the smell would distract them, then I turned around and started running. My wife said when I turned around, the boars left, which is really anticlimactic but it was the most unexpected and best outcome. The thing that convinced me to come forward with this information after all this time is that what I saw was light colored. Anyone I told about it at the time made fun of me because they said they were all black. It was at night in the summer of 1980. My husband was a farm worker and got off work very late. The grocery store would stay open all night, so once a month, we went into the grocery store when he got off work. We were coming back from the store, heading home, and the three kids were asleep in the back seat, and my husband was dozing off in the passenger seat. Because there had been so many deer out that year, I was driving rather slowly in case one ran out in front of me. I saw what I thought at first was a deer come from the brush and trees on the left side of the road. I slowed way down for it to cross in front of me. It was not a deer though. It was a very large light reddish brown, very hairy man. 
When the car lights hit his eyes, it made him blinded like it does deer, and he stopped in front of me and shielded his eyes. His eyes did not shine red, like wild animals' eyes do. His skin was light brown or tan, and he had freckling on his hands and exposed areas around his eyes. I know he was male because I could see his male parts in the lights from the car. He was right there, looking face to face with me. I stopped the car completely because I was afraid I would hit him. He got his bearings and turned and walked off the road. He did have a neck, but it was very short. The muscles in the top of his arms and shoulders were built up like a weightlifter's, and with the hair, it gave him the appearance of being humpbacked. I could see him through his hair because the lights were shining right through it. He was young and in good shape with well-developed muscles, tall enough that his male parts were above the level of the Ford hood when he reached his arms up. He also had a smell about him, a very strong smell, like a man who has been hitchhiking for a few weeks and a dog mixed together. The smell stayed in the car for a while. I had the road vents open. I also remember that he had head hair that was long, that hung over his body hair, and what seemed like beard hair on his face that started up under his eyes and covered his nose, leaving out only his mouth. His teeth were brown, his nose full and wide, and his mouth had full lips with the hair growing up over them. I have had other distant sightings in the Oregon woods, as when I was young. I spent a lot of time there, but this was my only face to face. I just sat there in amazement after he was gone. Then my husband woke up and asked why we were stopped. I tried to explain the whole experience, but I don't think he ever quite believed me. This occurred in early December, 2011 at around 2 a.m. in the morning. A friend and I were sitting in my bedroom hanging out whenever we both noticed something moving on my surveillance monitor. I had a camera pointed down my driveway so I could see whenever I had company drive up. When we both looked, I saw what appeared to be a large canine running on all fours and in mid-run. This thing came up on its hind legs and continued running across my field and across my drive and into my brother's field on two legs. I was in shock and my friend immediately turned to me with her mouth wide open. I asked her, what did you just see? And she replied with, well, what did you see? I saw where this was going so I then asked her, how many legs was it running on? She replied, it was running on four but went to two. I then had a cold chill run through my body as I knew she saw what I had seen. I jumped up and grabbed my night vision scope I had recently purchased and ran to my front door with my friend behind me. I must admit I was hesitant to open that door for fear of it maybe standing there. So I opened the door while letting out a roar, as to maybe shock it if it was there, but it wasn't. Hey, I didn't know. I cautiously walked out on my front porch and took the scope and scanned the front field. There was nothing to be seen, nor do I know which direction it went in besides where I had seen it last. I waited until daybreak and went out to where it crossed my driveway, and I found a paw print that was a good 12 by 12. I was stunned. I just stood there looking back at the woods it had came from and looked south to where it was headed. I had no way to save the print and didn't think to take a picture at the time, nor was my camera recording at the time of the sighting either. From what I could see on camera, this thing was massive in its upper body. I can still remember seeing the muscles flexing and the muscularity in its upper back as it came to its full height. It was running in weeds that came to my waist, but on all fours it was a good two feet above them, and when it went to full height I would estimate it to be a good eight foot tall. Due to the camera showing only B and W I didn't get to see its color, but it was dark. Its head is something else that stands out as I could see the snout, and its pointed ears which were laid back whenever it went to two legs. I am a R&D technician so I am trained to watch for details, and even though this thing was moving fast, faster than any human, I was transfixed on its form and what I was seeing. It was headed south and into property that connects to the Steny Space Center's buffer zone, which is over a 100,000 acres of untouched and uninhabited acreage that was put aside for the Space Shuttle program in Hancock County, Mississippi since the mid-60s. So it has all the resources it needs in order to survive in those woods and to go undetected. I have always been an outdoors man, but since that sighting, I will not go out in the woods without a gun on me now. 
I know for a fact I do not want to run into that thing up close. My encounter happened a few years ago, in South Jefferson Parish, Louisiana. Here in Louisiana, we call counties parishes, in case you didn't know. I was hunting deer or wild pigs one night, on a protection levee system that was built to protect the town from hurricane flood waters. As I walked to where the levee turns off to the left, there was a canal woods that was about a 100 yards from some houses. To the left was a natural ridge that goes out into swamps and marshes. Well, as I made that turn from the ridge of oak trees, I heard a growl. I thought it might have been a coyote or dog, so I walked slower. Then, I heard brush and a smaller sized tree shake and another growl. I shined my light in the direction of the sound and saw a pair of eyes that were reflecting an amber or yellow color. What surprised me was the fact that the brush was about six foot high and the eyes were about a foot above the brush. When I saw those eyes, I slowly backed up while keeping my light on the thing. As I walked back to the turn to head back to my truck, which was parked about three quarter of a mile away, it came out the woods. I lit the thing up with my light again. Now, I was probably 30 feet from it. I saw its whole body and face. The body was covered with black hair with some brown mixed in. The hair was thickest around its head, neck, chest, and upper back. It looked a lot like a lion's mane, but wasn't as pronounced. Since all of the hair was the same color, it had pointy ears with a little bit of hair coming off the points, making the ears seem a little longer. It stood on two legs, but the legs were weird and backwards like. The arms were really long, longer than the legs. Its hands were like a mixture of human and bear, like really big raccoon front paws. It had paws, but it also had fingers. That's the only way to describe it. If you watch the movie, The Howling, you'll get an idea what this thing looked like. It's as if whoever made that movie knew something others didn't. Now, at this point, I was freaking out so I pulled up my rifle. I hunt with a Romanian AK with a Calmo paint job I did myself. The way I was hunting wasn't exactly legal. That's why I took my Romanian AK. If I had to toss it, I wouldn't be out much money. The rounds I use are special rounds made to hunt feral hogs. I've dropped deer and hogs with these rounds before. One shot and they're done. But back to the story. As I pulled my rifle up to the ready, it growled and walked a few steps toward me. I fired a round right into its chest area. I knew I had hit it because the creature took a step back. As it stepped back, I ran toward my truck. That's when it let out a loud growl and a howl like I had never heard before. I grew up hunting and fishing and thought I knew everything in the woods, but I hadn't heard anything like the sounds it made before. As I ran back to the truck, it stalked me, but kept its distance. As I got close to the well-lit area, where my truck was parked, by the town library and elementary school, it stopped following me. I tried to find anyone who may have had similar encounters in the area, but all I could find was old legends of the Rougarou, which is pronounced ru ga -ru. I told my grandpa about what had happened, but told him it was a friend who had told me it happened to him. I also told him that it sounded like a crazy story to me. He told me when he was 17, in the same area, at night, hunting, he heard a howl like nothing he had ever heard before. He also told me that something had stalked him, as he ran home that night. He said he never saw what it was, but could hear it following him through the brush and swamps. That encounter has changed my life. My perception of what is real, and what is not will never be the same again. I still haven't gotten over that night. I went back a few days after that incident and found two large dog tracks, as big as my hand. I wear a size LG glove. I lived on a property called Upper Melinda for many years, and it's a local story going back to witch burning days, and long story short, they cut this woman in half, who was presumed to be a witch and they buried each half in a different place and kept Lower Melinda, a secret to this day, no one knows where it is. The legend is, if her halves find their way back to each other, she'd come back to life and haunt the town. Or some such. Upper Melinda's gravestone is on the property I lived on, and we had ghost hunters frequently hop our property looking for it. 
anyway. I have a few encounters, one where my son almost went zombie-like, heading straight into the woods like he was possessed. But the scarier memory was when I came home from work later one evening, and my toddler son at the time would usually run out to greet me. It was dark that night, and I heard him coming up to the side of my car, singing some tuneless something or other, and I smiled, rolled down my window to tell him to watch out, I was parking, and to be safe, etc. I could hear him right upside my car door and his sing-songing, and I didn't want to hit him with my car door. He went quiet, I opened my door, and because it was dark and no light illumination, I started looking around calling him by his name, and at that moment, the back porch light flicks on and my son comes barreling out the back door, followed by my husband. I was beyond confused because I'd literally been smiling and talking to a voice that sounded inches away from my car. The realization that it wasn't my son immediately sent icicles down my spine. It was mid-November, and I was going out to the family cabin for a few days of quiet hunting. My cabin was about two hours from the nearest town, and was so far out of the way that I couldn't get all the way there with my truck. I keep in a TV at the nearest cabin about eight miles from my property. I left my truck on my neighbor's property and headed off on the ATV. When I finally arrived, it was about 5.45 p.m., and the sun was making its long trek down the horizon. I took my rifle and checked the immediate area around the cabin, carefully making my way in the door checking for anyone who shouldn't be there. The place was empty, as usual, and I went about setting up lanterns and starting a fire in the wood-burning stove. It was freezing cold and all I could think about was getting the place heated up. I unloaded my gear and began preparing to spend the next day hunting in the surrounding wilderness when I heard a noise from outside. You get used to the sounds of wildlife in the woods and after a while you usually don't even notice much of it. But this was different. It was a heavy thud, followed by a soft metallic scraping. I got uneasy because there are no roads up here, there are game trails, but many are overgrown and wind in a maze through the forest. I grabbed my flashlight and sidearm and carefully went outside, circling the cabin in growing circles until I was assured that no one was out there. Strange, but I am tired from a long trip and sometimes silence can make you on edge. So I chalked it up to nothing more than me needing a good night's rest. So I finished getting my pack together, ate some rice and jerky, and went to bed. The next morning I set out at dawn. My plan was to make for a small clearing by the stream where my uncle built a stand in the tree line. I had been at it a couple of hours when I heard a soft thud. I looked in the direction of the noise and about 15 meters from where I sat, there was an arrow in the base of a tree. I was super annoyed and shouted out for whoever shot it to show themselves. Our property bumps up to other popular hunting areas, and we often have hunters on our land. It usually isn't a problem, but it infuriated me to have someone shooting off arrows willy-nilly through the clearing for no reason. Kids maybe, or drunks. Putting on the orange vest I brought in my pack, I scrambled down and away, cursing to myself about amateurs. I decided it would be a good time for a cup of coffee and a lunch break, so I went to my favorite spot in the woods and sat on the fallen tree, like so many times before. After boiling my water and steeping the grounds I sit, eating my rice and sipping my coffee, enjoying the peace, when suddenly I get the eerie feeling that something isn't right. Goosebumps suddenly run up my arm as I scan my surroundings. Was that arrow there when I arrived? Did I just not notice it? The dark gray shaft and broad, black tip were very familiar. It was the exact same as what I encountered earlier that morning. About 10 meters away, anxiety gripped me. Was someone following me? Was this a joke? Was that arrow meant for me? I frantically tried to convince myself that I was just being overly dramatic, that it was crazy to think someone was out here hunting me. But still, I couldn't shake the feeling. I gathered my things and headed back to the cabin, I suddenly found myself in need of a whiskey and the safety of four walls. After getting warm enough and in the comforts of a good book, I wasn't thinking too much about what happened. It was surely just a coincidence after all. I closed my eyes and drifted off into a nap. I don't know how much time passed, but when I suddenly woke up it was dark outside. There was a loud tapping at the window. I was frozen where I was, not able to comprehend what was happening. The tapping stopped 
and a few moments of silence before a big bang on the door. So hard that it shook on its hinges, I jumped up and shouted, Who is it? While I chambered around in my rifle, I was answered with a deep silence. Creeping to the door, I unlocked the latch and slowly opened the door to find nothing there. As I slowly walked to the outside of the window, I see the glass had been scraped up and down with something sharp. How long had that tapping noise been happening before I woke up? I fearfully ran back to the door, all I wanted was to have a locked door between me and whatever was here. I ran into the cabin, but before I could even shut the door I noticed it. Sitting in the middle of the table, a dark grey arrow with a broad, black tip. My mind spun. Our cabin was small enough to see the whole space from where I was standing, the table, the old sofa, the set of bunk beds, and the kitchen area with a few small cabinets. Nowhere for someone to hide. I turned quickly to look back out of the door, and that's when I saw him. A tall man looming just outside the tree line, maybe 15 yards from my door. The moon was bright enough for me to make out the long recurved bow in his hands. I slammed the door shut just in time to hear a heavy thud on the outside. That's when I remembered the sound from the night before. This man has been messing with me since I arrived. I shouted through the door, what do you want? But the man didn't respond. I knew I had to get out of there, but there was no way I was going to make it in the dark. I would have to wait until dawn. Frantically, I pushed everything I could in front of the door and made sure the window was locked and the drapes closed. No sleep was to be had, I huddled in fear all night in the back corner of the cabin with my rifle in my hand, shivering from cold and fear. The same questions kept running through my mind. What does the man want? Is he alone? What will he do to me? Why isn't he trying to break the window if he wants to kill me? Every half hour or so, there would be that same heavy thud on the outside of the door. I knew dawn would be coming soon so I grabbed a few things, but when I went to the key to the ATV, it was gone. The man took it so I couldn't leave. A brand new wave of fear rushed over my body. I grabbed an old tackle box off the top of the cabinets. My dad used to keep a spare key in here in case we lost one. Please be in here, please be in here, please be in here. It was so cold, but sweat dripped into my eyes. Yes, there it was. I peeked out of the window, but didn't see the man. I took a deep breath and threw open the door with a dozen arrows now sticking out of it, running as fast as I could to the ATV. Jumping on and shoving in the key, it took a few seconds for the engine to turn. As soon as it started I drove off, an arrow driving its way into the small pack on my back, barely missing my side by centimeters. Driving as fast as the terrain would allow, I got to my neighbors safely and retrieved my truck. As soon as I reached cell service I called the police. They never found anything, but I doubt they looked too hard, with the cabin that far out of the way. Even now, I often find myself wondering who that man was, and why he was terrorizing me. Did he want to kill me, or just scare me? Either way, I haven't gone back to that cabin since, and I don't think I ever will. Me and two friends were driving through the UK countryside in the middle of the night. We were traveling through a small county park when my friend slams on the brakes as he sees something lying up ahead in the middle of the road. We get out to take a look and upon close inspection we see it's an adult male deer. Our first thought is that it got hit by a car, but we can only see it from its back so we circle around it. The entire rear of the animal was missing. All limbs were present and stood out straight hovering above the ground slightly due to rigamorates. Lots of its organs were missing, and we could make out rounded puncture marks around the throat if the animal. I say rounded as we suspect it was a big cat of some kind, if it were canine the jawline would have been more V-shaped, and it must have been big to take down this prey. The odd thing was the lack of blood around it. We wondered if it had been moved or was in the process of being moved when we came along and spooked whatever was dragging it. We decided to park up round the corner and call a park ranger to come and move it. This road is on top of a hill a few hundred feet up and anyone could easily crash in the dark and tumble down the hillside. Couldn't have been 15 minutes later when we walked back to the road and the deer is gone. Without a trace. There have been rumors that someone released a big cat in southwest England many years ago. 
Occasionally some sheep show up mauled, but no one has ever seen or heard anything. We never went back at night again. Last year when I was truck driving, I was heading out to Salinas to pick up produce. It was maybe two something in the AM. I was on a county road with orchards on either side of me, no lights at all, except for my truck's headlights. Now, the dark regularly played tricks on my eyes when night driving. But for about a good 10 seconds, I swear I saw what looked like a giant wolf thing standing on its hind legs. What made this different from, say, a large coyote on its hind legs with front legs on the tree was that this wolf thing was not using a tree to stand up. And when I got closer, rather than going down on all fours and running away, it ran away on two legs for maybe 20 feet until I lost sight of it as I passed by. Also, my hair on the back of my neck stood up, and I got that weird, creepy feeling in my gut. And that has never happened before when the dark played tricks on my eyes. We rent a home that, for reasons no one will explain, is about half the rental rate in our area. We've been here for five years, and the owner has not raised the rent a dime. Strange things consistently happen in the house. Most of them are pretty benign and easily dismissed. Things being moved around without explanation, odd noises, feeling like someone is moving around when rooms are empty. Our dog will suddenly start barking at something he seems to see. But lately, things have become more aggressive. Several times, my wife and I have physically felt something touch us, only to turn and find the room empty. I felt a strong tap on my sternum. My wife had something blow in her ear, so deliberate that she actually started crying out of fear. Today was the strangest I went to open a door to a stairway down into the basement this morning, and the whole door fell onto me. It had been taken off the hinges, with the pins still in the hinge part on the frame. Aside from me, no one in our home is capable of doing this. Our two kids are young. The door was fine last night. I heard nothing during the night, and our dog sleeps next to that door. I have no explanation. What should we do? The time I fought a demon attached to me for three months. When I was 18, I started having dreams of a long-haired skeletal girl crawling up my stairs. Every single night without stopping, it would just be a dream of her inching up my stairs, and it was slow like one step a night. She had a sunken in face, deep set black eyes, and rose up rows of dark brown teeth. It took me a week before I knew something was wrong like these couldn't just be a nightmare. My stairs were always cold. There was a rotten stench that would hit me at times, and I was constantly irritable. At the end of the first week, I suddenly realized the cold, the smells, the heaviness in the air was in a different spot nightly, the spot she'd stop on the damn stairs. Days I wouldn't sleep for more than an hour or two after realizing I never dreamt of her if I slept less than four hours, maybe she could only manifest in REM sleep or something. I was constantly trying to find out what the hell she was and what I could do. I smudged my house, I threw up crosses everywhere, I felt like a mad woman as I drew protection symbols in holy water along my walls up the stairs and covered the area above my door with the scalpular of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, which if you ever have paranormal problems is the scalpular that is associated with all protection. No matter what I did, I couldn't rid her though. I was able to keep her at bay in the middle of the stairs, but that was it. I finally slept one full night without dreaming of her, so I thought I finally got rid of her, but no the next night she returned middle of stairs hissing, pacing back and forth, that was first night I seen her stand, and she had to be around 8 feet cause she was only a few inches shorter than the dip of the wall going over my stairs. I did more searching and realized she wasn't actually trapped in the house, she was attached to me, and knowing that I realized I damn wasted a lot of time because to banish her I had to change me she was attached to. My attitude and hoarding so I started cleaning my room often, constantly moving things to different parts of my room. I kept up as much positive energy I could and night by night, she was finally moving back down my stairs until one night she just never returned. It's been 17 years and I still sometimes wonder if she'll return. If she did that will be a damn terror cause my room is now next to the stairs, but I think she's gone for good. I still got a paranormal house though, 
Now I got the top hat man, two ghosts, and what I think is a mimic, but they 900% chill compared to that scary bitch. This sounds absolutely crazy and like I'm insane, but here it goes. In 2015, I came home from work early to let my dogs out before going to an appointment I had scheduled. I entered my home through the garage to kitchen door. As I turned the corner to my living room, I look for the dogs who didn't greet me as normal. I look down my hall and see a eight foot white rubber suit type creature or man bending all the way out of my laundry room. And although it was faceless, I could feel it staring at me like I startled it. It had no features, just tall, white, not human at all. I got the feeling like I just walked in on a home intruder, almost as if we were both confused as to why each other were there. I started screaming and it recoiled like a snake immediately and it was gone. I never saw it again, but a few months ago, my grandma who lives on the property in another house told me she was cleaning her upstairs hallway. She looked down her basement stairs into her laundry room and saw the white rubber suit man again. She then went on to explain she calls him that because she has seen him a few times and he is always near her washer or dryer. I almost lost it because the thing I saw came out of my laundry room. I have no explanation for it. My family has owned this property since the 60s when the original home was built and then mine in 2008. Before that it was part of a farm. The farm next to the house was recently preserved because the county considered it an important part of Civil War history. It was used by both the Confederate and Union as a campsite and was the home to some small skirmishes. We were house hunting and we went to a house that could have been the one, though it was small. It was a very old house as all the houses I've lived in and my first one was haunted but benign. To get to the parents' bedroom, we had to walk through the daughter's room she was about five. I've always been very sensitive, and I was standing in this girl's bedroom, and the most evil feeling washed over me. I could feel very angry eyes on me, and it penetrated my soul. I didn't make it to the parents' room. I couldn't stay in the child's room for more than a minute. I've experienced that feeling of evil only one other time, in an ancient cemetery in Ireland. When the owners returned, I asked them if their house was haunted. They were oblivious, so I just shared that I had concerns about the daughter's room. Meanwhile, the realtor went into the kitchen and had a mild stroke about me asking, I thought. On the drive away from the house, he asked me why I asked that. He then revealed that he'd grown up in what is famously considered one of the most haunted house in the state. We had lots to talk about on the way back to his office. I was in the Navy, stationed on my ship with my duty buddy while I was off work. The weather took a turn for the worse, and what started as a bad day quickly escalated. The duty officer of the deck OOD, a tiny black girl with the thickest Louisiana accent you'd ever heard, began frantically issuing emergency weather commands over the P. A system. In the midst of the chaos, the ship shore power lines were violently pulled from the ship as our moor lines succumbed to the relentless weather. I could only imagine the arc and spark show that ensued. However, for my duty buddy and me, who were nonchalantly enjoying beef bowls in my shop, all systems abruptly died. The ship fell into immediate silence, and darkness enveloped us for a few moments. Experiencing utter and complete silence on a vessel, with all systems offline, is something you never expect. It sends chills down your spine. The sudden hush in the midst of the storm left an indelible mark on my memory, a stark reminder of the unpredictable nature of the sea and the eerie moments it can bring. When we were hiking in Oregon Pipe Park campground right on the Mexican border, we went on a ranger program. It was a talk about light done on a full moon night. We all walked to a high point and listened to the ranger. When it was over, she said we could go back the same way or walk further on the trail to loop back to the campground. Everyone else went back, but we carried on. It was a beautiful warm and still night, perfectly illuminated by the full moon. We came around one corner and saw the face of a man, lighted up by his iPhone screen. 
It was two fully armed DEA agents dressed in Como sitting on ADVs. They were as startled as us. My husband in his best British accent said, hi chaps or something, and we carried on. When we reached the campground, it was swarming with D personnel. One of them told us that they were chasing five drug runners from Mexico. Thank goodness we didn't run into them or find ourselves in the middle. So, I'm in a three-day hike through the Pyrenees in Catalonia, northeastern Spain, just at the border with France, with family and friends. Must have been early summer, second night of the hike, and we're sleeping at a mountain refuge in a valley surrounded by mountain peaks. Very nice place. Most of the group is inside already sleeping. Some of us are outside just talking and watching the stars. Someone notices a light in the sky that moves in an odd manner, kind of zigzagging, and then standing still, no bigger than a star. So of course we laugh and talk about UFOs and so on, not thinking much of it. But the light keeps moving and someone points out, hey, isn't it getting bigger? And it certainly seems so, against the night sky is hard to tell for certain at the beginning. But while it continues to move erratically, it sure seems like it's getting bigger. And bigger. And the thing seems to go down and we lose sight of it behind the line of peaks. At the moment when we lost sight of it, from our vantage point, it looked to be about a basketball, a white, glowing basketball in size, so larger than the rest of stars. If it, whatever it was, went to the ground it must have been in one of the adjacent valleys, so a bit far but close enough to spook us. We went inside and spent the rest of the night afraid of getting abducted or something. I went hunting a couple times with my dad while I was in high school. We were on a week-long trip hunting for elk, so it involved a lot of hiking through the woods. Trying not to get noticed I should note though, that deer season had just started before the end of our trip. We were still wearing bright orange though, mind you. At one point, we crossed over a ridge and were making our way towards a valley, trying to see if there was anything down near a clearing at the bottom. Suddenly, we hear gunshots and the unmistakable sound of at least one bullet whizzing by not far from us. We looked towards the source of the noise further down the valley, and there were other hunters sitting in lawn chairs with their rifles up and beer cans all around them. I don't know if they were drunk or just were in the mood to shoot at anything that moved, but I've been afraid to go hiking during deer season ever since. I never thought hashtag wedding season would turn into a nightmare. But that's what happened when I attended my cousin's hashtag summer camp theme ceremony. Let me tell you how it all went wrong. It was supposed to be a fun and casual event. The bride and groom had rented a campsite in the woods, complete with cabins, tents, and a bonfire. They invited about 50 guests, mostly family and close friends, to join them for a weekend of hashtag summer vibes and hashtag BBQ time. I arrived on Friday afternoon, along with my sister and her boyfriend. We checked in at the reception, where we were given wristbands and assigned to a cabin. The wristbands had RFID chips that tracked our location and activity. They also served as keys to the cabins and facilities. The receptionist explained that the wristbands were part of a game that the couple had planned for their guests. I thought it sounded like a fun idea. I love escape rooms and scavenger hunts, and I was looking forward to bonding with my relatives and meeting new people. The receptionist also said that there was a leaderboard that showed the progress and ranking of each team. The top three teams would get special rewards at the end of the game. I was curious about the rewards, but the receptionist wouldn't tell me. She said it was a surprise and that we had to play the game to find out. She smiled and handed me a map of the campsite, along with a brochure that listed the rules and tips for the game. She wished me good luck and sent me on my way. I met up with my sister and her boyfriend, who had already gotten their wristbands and cabin assignment. We decided to explore the campsite and see what clues and puzzles we could find. We also wanted to check out the other facilities, such as the pool, the cafeteria, and the bonfire area. The campsite was huge and well-maintained. There were signs and arrows that pointed to the different attractions and amenities. There were also QR codes that we could scan with our phones to get more information and hints. 
The game seemed to be well designed and interactive. We had a blast finding and solving some of the clues and puzzles. They were challenging but not impossible, and they required a mix of logic, creativity, and teamwork. Some of them were hidden in plain sight, while others required us to search and explore. We felt like we were in a real-life adventure. We also met some of the other guests, who were also playing the game. They were friendly and cooperative, and we exchanged tips and compliments. We formed alliances and rivalries, and we checked the leaderboard to see how we were doing. We were in the top 10, and we were determined to climb Hisher. By the time the sun set, we had solved about half of the clues and puzzles. We decided to take a break and join the others for dinner at the cafeteria. The food was delicious and plentiful, and the atmosphere was festive and cheerful. Everyone was having a great time, and we toasted to the happy couple after dinner. We headed to the bonfire area, where the bride and groom were waiting for us. They thanked us for coming and for playing the game. They said they were impressed by our enthusiasm and skills, and that they had a special announcement to make. They asked us to gather around the fire and listen carefully. They said that the game was not over yet. In fact, it was just getting started. They said that the clues and puzzles we had solved so far were only the easy ones. The real challenge was about to begin. They said that the game was not just a game. It was a test. A test of our loyalty, our morality, and our survival. They said that they had a dark secret. A secret that they had kept from everyone for years. A secret that they were ready to reveal. They said that they were not human. They were something else. Something ancient and evil. Something that fed on human flesh and blood. Something that had lured us here for a feast. They said that they had rigged the wristbands with explosives. If we tried to remove them or escape, they would blow up. They said that they had also locked the gates and jammed the signals. There was no way out, and no one would hear us scream. They said that they had one final clue for us. A clue that would decide our fate. They said that there was a hidden bunker somewhere in the campsite. A bunker that had enough space and supplies for one person. A bunker that was the only safe place from them and their hunger. They said that the clue to the bunker's location was in the brochure that they had given us that they had given us at the reception. They said that we had until sunrise to find the bunker and claim it. Only one of us could enter the bunker, and the rest would be their prey. They said that they would hunt us down one by one, and that they would enjoy every bite. They said that this was their wedding gift to us. A gift of terror and death. They laughed and threw the brochure into the fire. They said that the game was on, and that they wished us good luck. They said that they loved us, and that they would see us soon. Then they turned and ran into the woods, leaving us in shock and horror. My boyfriend said I could post this here to get it off my chest and see if y'all could help me figure out what happened. A couple of years ago, my boyfriend and I downloaded Life 360, so we could know each other's exact location in case we needed to call the police to each other's location. I had a rough living situation. I moved in with my boyfriend and his mom right after I turned 18 into their apartment they've lived in since my boyfriend was a kid. About two months into me living there, my boyfriend's mom was taking him to work, and I got a notification that he left. Well, since I would be home alone for an hour, I decided to run myself a bubble bath to relax. A little bit later, I heard my boyfriend's footsteps coming up the stairs. He was the only one out of the three of us to wear heavy boots, so his footsteps were very distinct. Then I hear his voice call out to me while still walking up the steps, Baby, I'm home. I was really confused because he had just left, and there was no way he could be home already. I picked up my phone to see if he had texted me that work was called off, but as I unlocked my phone, I got a notification that he had just pulled into work. I started freaking out and slowly got out of the tub, wrapping a towel around me, trying to listen out for whoever must have broken in. The footsteps started again, and my boyfriend's voice called out again, Baby. The footsteps came right to the bathroom door and stopped. I stood there for God knows how long until I just ripped the door open, expecting the worst, but the hallway was empty. I checked all three rooms upstairs, but they were empty. I checked downstairs, but no one was there, and all the doors and windows were locked. 
We moved out a couple of months later, and whatever mimicked my boyfriend's voice and footsteps followed us to our new place and mimicked my voice to my boyfriend. Encounter with a killer on the bus. This seems like the right place to tell this story. It happened back in 2013. It was about 8, 9 o'clock, and I was on my way home from a pal's. I was sat upstairs at the back of the bus. There was only me and one other person on the top floor of bus, and he was sat near the front on the opposite side. When I got up to get of the bus and walked from the back towards the stairs he called me. Don't remember exactly how he asked, but he was asking for a lighter. I walked up to him going through my pockets and told him I had matches and handed them to him. He took them of me and just stared at them for a good few of seconds, and then handed them back to me and said something along the line of don't worry. The time it took him to decide not to use them felt very strange, and the eye contact before and after just felt intense. I got walked down the stairs thinking WTF was up with that and got off the bus. I told a couple people how weird it felt and described what he was wearing, a zip-up black hoodie with a knock-off Hardy-style tiger on the chest. Fast forward about a week, and there's a fatal stabbing on a bus in my city. A young girl on her way to school was stabbed to death on the top deck of a bus. Stabbings are pretty common in my city, but a young girl being killed on her way to school that's big news anywhere. They show a photo of the suspect being arrested, but you can only see the back of his hoodie. Straight away I think that's the exact same Ed Hardy knockoff and start wondering if it's the guy I had seen. When they released more photos of him from the front I knew it was him. The scary thing is it transpired he had recently been let out of a mental health facility. He hadn't been given any support and had been sleeping rough on buses. I've had many interactions with mentally ill people and dangerous individuals, but this is one that stays with me. Even though the interaction was much it felt so strange. I always wonder if he was seeing how I reacted when he asked me hence why he didn't use the matches. Who know it's just a sad story really. RIP to the poor girl who was murdered. Her name was Christina Edkins, she was 16 years old. Before recounting my sighting, let me provide some background information. Crosswicks or Chesterfield, New Jersey, is a recognized Revolutionary War battleground with potential supernatural and paranormal significance, as evidenced by a cannonball lodged in an old building. Now, to my recent experience. A few days ago, approximately around 9 p.m., I was returning home from my current job. The night was exceptionally dark, typical of rural areas like Chesterfield, where miles of farmland stretch as far as the eye can see. The lack of visibility at night makes the surroundings appear almost impenetrable. As I navigated the long, dimly lit roadways, something caught my attention. From the wooded side of the road, a massive creature emerged, swiftly crossing into the fields. It was unlike anything I had ever encountered a creature of immense size, resembling the largest coyote or wolf I'd ever seen, about the size of a doe. Its gaze met mine as it traversed the road and the intensity of its bright yellow eyes was unforgettable. The creature's coat was a deep, dark shade of brown, and it moved on all fours, radiating an intimidating presence. Baffled and intrigued, I immediately alerted my family about the presence of this unusually large canid in the area. The mystery deepened as I contemplated what I had witnessed. Could it be a hellhound, a dogman, or perhaps an exceptionally large wolf? The enigma lingered, and I sought answers. Adding another layer to the puzzle, I noted that the surroundings of my family's house, not far from the sighting location and surrounded by woods, had been unusually quiet in the nights following the encounter. The eerie silence only heightened the sense of mystery surrounding the creature. Seeking insights, I turned to this platform in the hope that someone might share similar experiences or possess knowledge about the supernatural occurrences in this historically significant area. The quest for answers continues, fueled by the desire to unravel the mysteries of that dark, fateful night in Chesterfield, New Jersey. A friend and I saw something several years back. It was very thin and its skin looked as if it had a full body latex suit on. Very shiny. 
bone structure in its face, but no eyes or orifices. You could see the ribs. Head was elongated and fingers long and pointy. Had a peculiar looking gait to it. This was late at night, and the creature was directly under a security light in my friend's backyard. We had been sitting quietly in his truck. This thing walked up not noticing us. Maybe 15 feet in front of us, directly under the security light. My friend screamed, and it jumped and faced us. It then took off towards the woods. We had been gone for a while, and just sitting in the driveway chilling. Before we went in, we had actually pushed the truck to the house because we had ran out of gas right before we got back to his house. We finally got brave enough to run into the house, but the door was locked and he didn't have a key because he never locked the house. Then we go around the house to try to get through his bedroom window, only to find that it was open. Not only was it open, but the screen was wadded up and shredded on the ground. Anyone have any idea what this thing could have been? This was in 1996 or 97. I've never been able to figure it out. I was in my mid-teens with a friend who was staying the night. We were looking out of my bedroom window, which was on a hill about three miles inland from the sea. This is the south coast of the UK, so had a panoramic view out to sea. You could see miles both east and west as well as out to the horizon. Clear night, you could see the sea quite clearly. I guess there was probably some light from the moon. Over on the far left of seat, about five, six red lights seemed to flicker into existence on the surface of the sea. They were quite bright, but nothing crazy. But they were moving to the right, incredibly fast. Like, faster than any boat you could imagine, basically streaking across. They'd sort of go one at a time in quick succession, slightly flickering as they went. They went in little bursts, like maybe 10% of the full area I could see, then another 10%, etc. My friend and I were amazed, couldn't work out what the hell they were, and kept staring. After about two, three minutes, they'd pretty much got all the way to the right. Then they all seemed to flicker out completely. Then they reappeared back where they'd started, and the whole thing started again. My memory is they completely flickered out, this time a bit sooner, and that was it. The whole thing was about five, six minutes, so there's just no rational thing this can have been to me. Other than flotillas of impossibly fast boats, which I just can't see in a million years how they could have been that given the speed and behavior. And also who the hell is doing that with what would have to be two sets of boats at 11 p.m. at night and coordinating it. So one lot left immediately after the first, etc. The other option is someone shining lights out to sea from the beach, I guess. But it's much too big an area. And anyway, the lights were twinkling in a way that meant they were clearly shining out. And again, who the hell would have set that up for some weird five minute display? So yeah, aliens, I guess. Even then, floating aliens. Never really heard of those, although there are some stories of craft coming out of the sea egg, some elements of the Nimitz story. All just very weird anyway. The night was thick with an eerie stillness as I patrolled the campsite. The recent rash of nocturnal attacks had left campers terrified and scarred, their injuries a haunting reminder of the terrors that lurked in the darkness. Determined to uncover the truth behind these harrowing encounters, I delved into Reddit accounts, desperate for answers. The horror stories I discovered chilled me to the bone. People spoke of being stalked by creatures known as the Night Howlers, cryptids with the appearance of humanoid wolves and glowing red eyes. The stories described relentless assaults, blood-curdling howls, and a primal fear that clung to their every step, armed with this newfound knowledge. My fellow rangers and I set out to protect the campers and unearth the mystery that shrouded these cryptids. We fortified the campsite, implementing additional security measures to ward off the night howler's advances. But we knew it was merely a temporary solution. As night fell, we stationed ourselves at strategic points, our senses on high alert. The moon cast an ethereal glow casting long shadows that seemed to dance with every rustle of the trees. An oppressive silence weighed upon us as we waited, ready to confront the creatures that haunted the campsite. Suddenly, piercing howls shattered the tranquility, sending a chill down my spine. The night howlers emerged from the darkness, their glowing red eyes fixated on their prey. Their snarls reverberated through the night, an ominous symphony that struck fear into our hearts. 
With calculated precision, we fought back. Flashes of light cut through the shadows as we brandished our flashlights and fired warning shots into the air. The night howlers hesitated, their savage instincts momentarily disrupted. It was a temporary reprieve, but it gave us the opportunity to devise a plan. Through trial and error, we began to unravel the secrets behind these creatures. We learned that they were sensitive to bright light and loud noises, exploiting this weakness to create deterrence that kept the campsite safer. Yet, we couldn't ignore the fact that these cryptids posed a real threat to both campers and ourselves. Night after night, we patrolled the campsite, facing the relentless assaults of the night howlers. Each encounter brought us closer to understanding their patterns, their vulnerabilities, and the dark forces that brought them to our realm. Finally, the pieces of the puzzle fell into place. The night howlers were not mindless predators. They were victims of an ancient curse that bound them to the campsite. Guided by this revelation, we embarked on a mission to break the curse, freeing both the night howlers and the campers from the cycle of terror. With the knowledge we had acquired, we performed a ritual under the moonlit sky. Ancient words whispered on the wind, intertwining with our collective determination. A surge of energy pulsed through the campsite, dispelling the curse that held the night howlers captive. As the curse shattered, the night howlers let out one final mournful howl before fading away into the night. The campsite fell silent once again, the air heavy with a mix of relief and exhaustion. We had succeeded in protecting the campers and freeing the night howlers from their tortured existence. In the aftermath of this ordeal, we took steps to ensure the campsite remained secure, prepared for any future threats that may arise. The memories of those nights plagued by the night howlers would forever be etched in our minds, a reminder of the resilience of both human and cryptid alike. From that moment forward, the campsite flourished, its visitors blissfully unaware of the horrors that had once plagued it. The tale of the night howlers would fade into the realm of campfire stories, a reminder to tread cautiously in the wilderness, where mysteries and cryptids coexist in the shadows of the night. Myself and three other guys were sitting in camp just after the holidays, getting stuff set up for the crew to come in the next week. The camp was in the middle of No, we're in the inlets of the west coast of British Columbia. Philip's arm, to be exact. Anyways, all of us were in the camp house just finished dinner and playing some crib having drinks. All of a sudden we hear the door of the camp house close and a male voice say hello. All of us heard it spooked as hell, we all investigate. Find no trace of anyone in the camp. The only way in was by boat or plane. Second story. Not mine heard from a few old timers I've worked with. Back in the 80s, they were logging an old growth site on Indian land. One mechanic found an old Indian grave in a hollowed out cedar. Decided to take the skull and bring it back to the shop. Everyone told him to bring it back to where he found it, which he did. A few days later, he was working underneath a jacked up fat truck and the jacks let go and crushed him dead. I've been into lots of Indian areas on the coast and have had the hairs on my neck stand up multiple times. Hiked into a lake one time and had boulders being thrown into a lake and howling going on. We got the F out of there pretty quick. I've read a few native folklore books about the coast and they can't be wrong with what I've seen and heard through the years. My son was riding a four-wheeler in the mountains. While riding up a steep trail, he came across a very strong odor across between a bear and a skunk, but much more obnoxious. Unlike that of a bear or a dead carcass, we are avid, knowledgeable hunters aware of our environment and the habits and smells of animals. When something is very different and out of the ordinary, we take note of it. The odor was gone on his return trip down the trail a steep road to a tower. He said the odor, being so strong and obnoxious, made him feel a little scared, knowing that it wasn't the usual, and that we are aware of the existence of such creatures as Bigfoot, though having not seen one. The weather was cool and a nice riding day. It was sometime early spring or summer, possibly around April, and in a mountainous area a few roads, but where there was a rocky road going up to a lookout tower. It was steep terrain and tall timber, 
and the road is not used except by those using the tower. I've spent years hunting in the wilderness, but nothing could have prepared me for the swamps of Louisiana. Local hunters had been disappearing, vanishing into thin air, and it was my team's job to find out why. We were confident, even cocky, assured that our skills and experience would see us through how wrong we were. The AU was like another world, a maze of stagnant water and twisted trees draped with Spanish moss. The air was heavy, the silence only broken by the occasional croak of a bullfrog or the splash of unseen creatures beneath the murky water. We began our search for the missing hunters, unaware that we were heading into the lair of something unimaginable. We found the first sign on the third day, a boot half sunk in the mud, still warm. It belonged to one of the missing hunters. That's when we felt it for the first time, a prickle on the back of our necks, the sense of being watched. As we delved deeper into the swamp, that feeling grew stronger. It was on the fifth day that we finally saw it. A creature, massive and terrifying, its eyes glinting in the dim light. It was like nothing I'd ever seen before. A grotesque combination of reptile and mammal, covered in thick, mottled scales. It moved with a surprising speed, disappearing into the undergrowth before we could react. The game had changed. We were no longer the hunters. We were the hunted. Our numbers dwindled as the creature picked us off one by one our weapons seeming to have no effect on it. It was a nightmare, a waking nightmare, and the swamp was its domain. In the end, it was just me and the creature. I could see it circling me, its eyes glowing in the darkness. I knew it was my do or die moment. I had to face this monster and put an end to the terror it had unleashed upon the swamps. Adrenaline coursed through my veins as I steadied my rifle, taking aim at the creature's menacing eyes. It lunged at me, its jaws wide open, and I pulled the trigger. The shot rang out, and the creature let out an unearthly screech before collapsing to the ground. I cautiously approached its fallen body, my heart pounding. My breath ragged. It lay there, motionless, its twisted, grotesque form a testament to the terror it had wrought. I'd done it. I'd killed the creature, avenged my fallen comrades, and put an end to the nightmare. But as I reached out to touch its scaly hide... The unimaginable happened. The creature's body began to fade, like mist dissipating in the morning sun. Within moments, it was gone, leaving me standing in the swamp, bewildered and alone. I searched the area, desperate to find some trace of the creature I'd just slain, but there was nothing. No blood, no tracks, no body. It was as if it had never existed. I returned home, haunted by the events in the swamp. My friends and family listened to my tale with disbelief, but I swore it was the truth. I knew what I'd seen, what I'd fought and what I'd killed, but without the body, I had no proof. The swamps had swallowed the creature, just as they had swallowed the missing hunters. The mystery of the Louisiana swamps remained unsolved, and I was left with the chilling knowledge that somewhere out there, the creature might still be lurking, waiting for its next victim. Late last night, my daughter 21, her friend 21, and I 43 had spent the evening at a drag show in Galveston, Texas. After the show, we decided to drive down to the beach for a few minutes before we headed home. The beach we usually go to was kind of a far drive from where we were, and it was almost 3 a.m., so we decided to pull into a beach access that we had never been to before. I pulled in and drove around in a circle to shine the headlights in a 360 so we could kind of scope out the area before we got out. I parked next to a trash can kind of close to the dunes. As soon as we got out of the car, I felt a heaviness, hard to explain. Just something felt weird, and my intuition was to get back in the car immediately and leave. I wish I would have. I didn't find out until later that my daughter and her friend had the same feeling. There was no moon, so the only light was from a few beach houses on the other side of the dunes. I keep a huge Batten flashlight slash taser in my car, so I grabbed it and we walked down to the water. Suddenly, out of the corner of my eye, I saw my daughter's friend turn around really fast and look back towards the car. She had heard a sound coming from the direction of the dunes. She grabbed my flashlight and pointed it towards my car. 
and she and I both saw something standing right up against my car. Neither of us were exactly sure of what we were looking at, because it seemed to fade away when the flashlight hit it. It's so hard to describe, but it was like you could only see it in the edge of the light from the flashlight. Like it only existed between light and dark. I grabbed the flashlight back and shined it directly where it was standing, and it was gone, just kind of disappeared. It was very surreal. This heaviness that I felt when we first got there was suddenly unbearable, and we all knew we had to leave as quickly as possible, but we were all kind of frozen in fear. We slowly made our way back to the car, but as we got close, my daughter and her friend saw the same figure crouched down next to the trash can with its back facing them. It was eerily silent as we ran to the car, jumped in, sped off. It was complete silence in the car for a few minutes until we got down the road a bit. Then I asked if they wanted to talk about what we just saw and we all just collectively freaked the absolute F.U.F. out, tears, and everything. My daughter only saw it from the front for a split second, but her friend and I looked directly at it, and we both described exactly the same thing. Judging by the height of my car, we estimated it to be at least six feet two, six feet five. It was very tall and slim. It had a human shape, but the face was just kind of blank with two black spaces where eyes should be. Like the eyes were there, just really sunk in. Its face kind of had the shape of a long Gandalf-type beard, but it was fleshy, not hair. It had really long arms, one of which was resting on the top of my car on the back passenger door. It seemed to be wearing what looked like a robe, but it was part of the creature. Like his flesh was in the shape of long robe sleeves. No hands, just long fleshy flaps. It was just standing there kind of slouching, like it wasn't standing up all the way. And it just stared blankly at us, almost through us. When I say a heavy feeling, we could physically feel some sort of presence as soon as we had gotten there. I personally have never felt so much anxiety, fear, and terror in my life. I have no idea what the F we saw, but there is definitely a lingering wary feeling through my whole body since it happened that I can't seem to shake. My daughter says she feels the same way. Every time we talk about it, we get chills. I'm super bad at drawing, but I tried my best to draw what I saw. My name is Corporal Isaac Martinez, and I was part of a five-man National Guard unit dispatched to the remote town of Elk Ridge, bordering Sequoia National Park. The call for evacuation came after the local sheriff's office was flooded with reports of a terrifying creature, a dogman. As night cloaked the town, the beast made its presence known, its guttural growls echoing through the night. It was unlike anything we had faced before, a monstrous hybrid of man and beast. The mission had turned from evacuation to survival. We fought. Not just for ourselves, but for the terrified citizens we had sworn to protect. Amidst the chaos, we started piecing together a horrifying possibility. The Dogman. Could it be one of our own? One of our friends who had gone missing in these woods months ago. The reality hit us like a punch to the gut. We were not just fighting a creature. We were fighting a brother. A man who once stood by our side, now a monstrous predator. The creature was relentless. One by one, my comrades fell. I can still hear their screams, their desperate pleas for mercy. But the beast showed none. It was just me, alone and cornered, waiting for my end. But the end didn't come. The dogman, it just spared me. I don't know why. I collapsed from exhaustion, the adrenaline finally wearing off. The next day, I was found by park rangers, delirious and shaken. As they helped me to my feet, one of them recoiled. Your teeth, he stammered. I ran my tongue across my teeth, feeling the sharp points of new, abnormal fangs. The rangers and I shared a look of horrified understanding, but we knew this had to stay silent. What happened in Elk Ridge would be buried along with my fallen brothers. The world would never know the truth. I was left with a burden, a secret, and a horrifying reality. The dogman was gone. But maybe, just maybe, a part of him was now a part of me. Sit here now, burdened by the weight of the truth that has forever changed my life. My name is Mark, and I was a member of a Navy SEAL team led by a man named Joe. Our assignment took us to a remote outpost in war-torn Syria. 
a place where danger lurked around every corner. Little did we know that the true horror we would face was not from the living, but from the restless spirits of the dead. It began with strange occurrences during our night shifts in the barracks. Unexplained whispers echoed through the halls, chilling our bones and filling our hearts with an unyielding sense of dread. Shadows danced along the walls, their ethereal forms mocking our mortal presence. Curiosity consumed us, and we couldn't ignore the unsettling atmosphere any longer. Joe, a seasoned hunter with a keen sense of intuition, took charge of our investigation. We delved into the history of the outpost, uncovering the dark secrets that had been buried beneath its very foundations. To our horror, we discovered that the outpost was built upon a massive grave. Countless lives had been lost in the battles that had ravaged this land, their souls trapped and tormented by the atrocities committed upon them. The vengeful spirits of the fallen soldiers haunted the outpost, seeking retribution for the lives unjustly taken. Night after night, we faced the wrath of these vengeful spirits. Their anguished cries echoed through the barren halls, sending shivers down our spines. We fought back, using every weapon at our disposal, both physical and spiritual. It was a battle unlike any we had faced before, a war waged against the ethereal realm. Our team was decimated, the majority of our men lost to the relentless onslaught of the vengeful ghosts. Yet, in the face of adversity, we refused to surrender. We rallied together, our determination fueled by the memory of our fallen comrades. With a desperate plan in mind, we set out to break the cycle of torment that plagued the outpost. Armed with dynamite, we ventured deep into the bowels of the structure, to the heart of the mass grave that lay beneath. The ghosts, sensing our purpose, grew more aggressive, their ethereal forms manifesting with increasing fury. As we reached the epicenter, our hands trembling, with a mix of fear and resolve. We set the detonator. The explosion reverberated through the outpost, ripping through the physical and spiritual realms alike. The earth shook beneath our feet as the structure crumbled, taking the ghosts and the grave with it. We fled the collapsing outpost, our bodies battered and our hearts heavy with loss. The souls of the fallen soldiers were finally freed, their spirits released from the chains that had bound them for far too long. In their sacrifice, we found a semblance of victory. Now, as I recount this tale, I do so with a heavy heart. The memories of that haunted outpost will forever haunt my dreams, a constant reminder of the horrors we faced. I carry the weight of their sacrifice, their voices echoing in my ears, urging me to never forget. The world may never know the truth of what happened in that remote outpost, but I share this story as a testament to the bravery and resilience of my fellow SEALs. We faced not only the terrors of war, but also the wrath of vengeful spirits. We stood our ground, fought until the bitter end, and left no stone unturned in our pursuit of peace. May the souls of the fallen soldiers find solace in the oblivion that awaited them, and may their sacrifice never be forgotten. Last summer, my boyfriend and I were camping in the Uachita Forest, off the Winona Scenic Route. We drove through a gorgeous spillway to a creek site where we had set up our camp and were laying in the hammock for the night. Next thing I know our dog is growling this deep growl. I'd never heard her make so it caught my attention. I look in the direction she's growling in and I see this weird humanoid figure just casually walking in the woods about 10-20 feet away from us. It's a light gray, maybe white color, 7 feet tall, very skinny, and has an abnormally large head. Our dog barks and catches its attention. It stops for a good 20 seconds, looks at us, then carries on its way. Needless to say, we immediately packed everything up and left. We hadn't taken anything recreational that night, though I sort of wish we had now. I truly don't know what I saw, but I'm so curious if we were the only ones to see have ever seen anything like that in that area. In 1991, I had moved to the Oxford Hills region of Maine and began exploring the forest. I would kill a day exploring, make your way to a stream or a snowmobile trail, and find your way back to civilization. One day I got into an area that was pretty far off. I had to cross a waist-deep river and a couple small creeks before coming upon this ridge leading up to a flat-topped hill covered with tall trees. 
My goal was to get atop and see if I could spot a way out better than how I got in. Atop the hill, I saw something amongst the trees and thought my eyes were playing tricks on me. I walked right up to it. It was a 1980 school bus in pretty damn good condition. The trees boxing it in were 40 or so feet tall birch trees. There were no obvious paths it could have driven on to get there. So, seeing it was less than 10 years old, I can only assume someone stole it when it was new, and maybe a path and washed out in the years since. As an ex-park ranger turned soldier, I've seen my fair share of strange and terrifying things, but nothing could have prepared me for what I encountered during my tour in Afghanistan in 2019. When we first arrived at base, it was unlike anything I had ever seen. There was nothing but a barren wasteland, and the only thing to eat was this strange, bland food that seemed to have no nutritional value. But we were soldiers, and we were used to roughing it, so we didn't think much of it. One day, while on patrol through a local town, my squad and I were ordered to investigate a strange alley that had been reported by locals. As we made our way down the narrow passage, we heard a roar unlike anything I had ever heard before. My heart was pounding in my chest as we cautiously approached the end of the alley. And then we saw it, a creature that defied description. It was a massive, hulking thing covered in thick, matted fur. It had the body of an ape, but the face of something far more sinister. It let out a deafening roar and lunged at us, but we were quick to react. We unleashed a hail of bullets from our automatic rifles, and the creature fell to the ground, dead. As we approached the body to examine it, we were met with resistance from the locals. They were fiercely protective of the creature and wouldn't allow us to get too close. We were puzzled by their behavior, but we didn't want to cause any more trouble, so we left the creature where it lay and continued our patrol. But the memory of that creature stayed with me, even after we returned to base. I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something off about it, something that didn't quite fit with what we knew about the world. I couldn't help but wonder what other strange and terrifying creatures might be lurking in the shadows of this mysterious country. I was visiting my aunt in northeast Illinois, just north of Chicago, in the summer of 2002. We were outside for a noon barbecue. My cousin Eddie Nyaj 9 runs over to my aunt yelling that the bird's back. So we all look over to where the kid's pointing, and not even 100 feet away and about 50 feet up was this huge freaking bird. My mom is, is afraid of anything with more than two legs. So she starts totally freaking out the funniest thing I've ever seen. So she grabs the kids and runs inside faster than if the devil was on her tail. My stepdad and uncle both have video cameras pointed at it. Now my uncle Richie works as a cameraman at one of the local news stations over there, so he knows how to use a camera. My stepdad unfortunately doesn't, and the video that we took home is shaky and blurred most of the time. This bird was big, I talking 15-20 feet freaking wings. It circled a couple of times, and then headed east at 1.14 p.m. I have the exact time because every few seconds I'd in shorthand, write down the time and the activity. I'm a part-time ghost investigator here in Southern California and very good about writing things down very quickly. It was black with brown feather tips. Its beak fit the body and looked kind of like a cross between a crow and a hawk. Keep in mind that I'm five feet three, looking at 100 feet and up at 50, 60 feet. This was way cooler than any ghost I've seen yet. Well, as I said, my investigator instincts took over, and when I was asking a whole bunch of normally reserved for ghosts questions, I found out that the bird showed up at the aunt and uncle's ranch at least once a month. This is so cool. I only wish my uncle would make me a copy of his tape so I could show you guys. This could very easily not be a skinwalker, but wanted to post anyway. I was with my friends walking through the woods late at night a few weeks ago, and this area is supposedly haunted, so some of them were scared. I was mentioning skinwalkers and how they can appear if you mention them just to try and scare my friends. Not too much later, we saw eyes in the woods, which appeared to be a mountain lion when we got closer. We live in South Central Connecticut, so mountain lions are extremely rare. My friends started running away and I followed. 
We looked back and saw the eyes behind us a few times, but eventually it went away. Does this sound similar to other Skiwalker stories? Or am I just being paranoid? I was working late last night, and while I was taking out the garbage, when I arrived at the dumpsters, I smelled a stench similar to wet dog and blood. I looked up when I heard rustling in a bush, and I saw a large black creature, about seven, eight feet tall, covered in fur. It appeared to be humanoid in shape, except with the head of a wolf slash coyote. It had its back towards me and was walking towards a dark area in the forest. I immediately ran away when I saw it so I didn't get a picture. I'm still not sure what it was, but my coworker told me it was probably a skinwalker and I really can't think of any other explanations. Does anyone have any other explanations? Does anyone know if there are skinwalkers in this area? Should I be concerned? I've been a National Guard sniper for most of my adult life. A single mission gone wrong had driven me to hang up my rifle and retire. But when an unknown predator resurfaced in the Middle East, a weapon of terror used by extremists for high-profile assassinations, I was pulled back into the shadows. I was hesitant, still haunted by the face of a fallen comrade from that ill-fated mission. But I knew I couldn't turn my back on the world teetering on the brink of chaos. So I gathered my old team, a group of men as scarred by the past as I was. Navigating the political landscape was like crossing a minefield. Allies could be enemies, and enemies allies. Trust was a luxury we couldn't afford. We had one mission, to eliminate the threat, and we couldn't afford to fail. The Middle East was as hostile and unforgiving as I remembered. Sandstorms, roasting heat, and the constant threat of an enemy strike. But we pressed on, using every bit of our training and experience to track down the predator. As we closed in, we were forced to confront our past. Memories of our last mission surfaced, the one that had left us broken. The pain was real, but we used it, let it fuel our determination to not repeat the same mistakes. The climax came in the ruins of an ancient city, a fitting battleground for our final confrontation. The predator was a sniper, just like us, a ghost with a rifle. The duel was tense, a game of patience and precision. We were both shadows, invisible and lethal. But I had something he didn't. I had a team, brothers who had my back. While I kept the enemy sniper engaged, my team flanked him, turning the tables. In the end, it was a single shot that ended it. A bullet that traveled over a kilometer, guided by years of experience and the collective breath of my team. The predator was no more. We returned home, not as heroes, but as soldiers who had done their duty. The world was safe, at least for now. As for me, I found a sort of peace. I realized that I couldn't run away from my past, but I could learn from it, use it to make a difference. And that's exactly what I intended to do. This is a Bigfoot encounter told to me by my grandfather. It happened in the early fall of 1938. He and his friends did a backpacking trip to a small remote lake near Mount St. Helens. They did this annually. One year they even summited the volcano during their yearly camping trip. This particular year there were five of them. The hike in took a couple of days back then. There weren't as many dirt roads built as there are now. They chose late summer and early fall when the berries were in season and the fish were usually biting well because they did not want to pack much food. It helped to lighten the load of their heavy backpacks. My grandfather was a little over 20 years old during this backpacking trip. After the two-day hike to the lake, they set up camp and decided the next morning that my grandfather and another guy would try to catch some fish. The other three young men would go collect berries. The next morning, they did just that. My grandfather walked to the far side of the lake, and his friend was on the side, nearer to camp. The fish were biting, and he had caught a few, when all of a sudden he started to feel uneasy, as if he were being watched. The hair on the back of his neck seemed to stand on end, and then he got a whiff of a foul rotting stench. He started to look around, and directly behind him, only 20 to 30 feet away, were three giant human-like creatures covered in dark brown hair from head to toe standing at the tree line. 
My grandfather was a large man, around six feet four, and the smallest of the three creatures was just as tall as him. However, it was much wider, at the shoulders, and much thicker. According to what he was looking at, the next creature was a foot taller, and then the third was even a foot taller than that one, putting each of them at six feet or better. The next one was over seven feet, and the other one was over eight feet tall. He was overwhelmed with adrenaline from fear and panic. He wanted to run, however. These three giants staring at him were blocking the only direction that he could run. The only way he could get away would be to leap into the lake and swim. He decided his best option was to calm down and keep doing what he was doing. He cast in his line and began to fish again. Shortly after that, he caught another nice trout, and while reeling it in it dawned on him that these creatures may be here for his fish. He unhooked the trout and tossed it to them. The smallest of the three stepped away from the tree line and retrieved the trout and brought it back to the other two, so he continued to toss fish to them. The smaller, the three Bigfoot continued to retrieve the trout. After a while, he landed a really nice fourth trout. He went to toss it back to them, but they were gone. He then grabbed his equipment and ran around the lake in the direction of the other friend. After finding him, he said that they need to get the hell out of there and began to tell him what happened as they headed back to camp. When they got to camp, the other friends were already there, picking up camp gear and in a hurry. They stated that they ran across three giant hairy creatures while out berry hunting. It took the group only a day to hike back out downhill. They did not know what they had encountered. They had never heard of anything like that in the 1930s since the term Bigfoot had not been known. After that trip, they never went back to Mount St. Helens. They changed the location of their yearly backpacking trip. My grandfather stated it wasn't until the 1967 Patterson or Gimlin Bigfoot film was shown in theaters across the nation that he finally had a name for the three giant creatures he had a close encounter with. My buddy came down to archery hunt deer with me one year. I took him to a spot where I'd had a few decent bucks on camera in a big bowl with a pine thicket right smack in the middle. We set up on the downwind side of the thicket in the same tree. We didn't see much that evening. It got dark and we decided to call it quits and climb down. I got down first and started packing up my climber, and he had just hit the ground when I heard leaves crunching a little ways off, and I said shake, listen, and the crunching got closer and closer, and then it was close enough that we could hear it breathing hard. My first thought was bear and I started scrambling for my flashlight. I got it out of my pocket, and by this time whatever monstrous creature we heard was about 20 feet from us. I got my light flicked on, just in time to see my cocker spaniel barreling towards me. I started laughing and turned around to look at my buddy, and he wasn't there. I shined around, nothing. I shined up in the tree we just came out of, and there was my buddy clinging onto that old oak for dear life about 10 feet up. So yeah, that's the story of my 35 pound cocker spaniel treeing my 240 pound best friend. This was a few years ago, in my old house, around Halloween. One day I, 43 male, was home alone in my house. I have a wife, three kids, and a dog. I'm in my basement cutting wood and working, when all of a sudden I hear thumping on the ceiling above me first level floor. It's rhythmic and almost perfectly in beat. I'm a handyman and do a lot of my own fixing and know the usual sound houses make. This was not usual. I start to follow the thumping around the first floor. It's as if someone thing is walking around. I call out my wife's name, no answer. My kids, no answer. Just soft moaning is getting louder with the thumps. My dog is with me in the basement and following the sound with me with this tail straight up, completely silent. This was weird because I have a loud jumpy dog. I then slowly follow the thumping to the steps and I hear a weak old woman's voice calling for Jimmy, my name, but my name does start with a G over and over. Ignoring my hellos, she keeps walking around my first floor, calling out, moaning, thumping. I grab my dog by the collar and leave out the basement door and walk around the outside of my house. Earth noting, I've had a lot of weird supernatural things happen in my life, especially around Halloween, but could feel this was different, very different. 
I go up to the street and there is a younger couple calling out for someone. Let's say Nancy for the sake of this. I go up to them and say, are you Jimmy? The young guy looks at me in simultaneous relief and confusion crossed his face. He tells me that's his dad's name, but he passed years ago. Turns out Nancy was his mom with some kind of mental issue. She snuck out of their house up the road. Her family lived in my house before we did know that, and she was having some kind of episode. Went looking for her husband in her home. Oh, also, she has a wooden leg. Don't know the story, but that was the thumping. We got her home safely, and I also double locked my doors from that point on. I've always been the kind of man who thrived in adversity. As a Navy SEAL, it was practically a job requirement, but nothing could have prepared me for the icy, relentless wilderness of the Arctic. Our mission was simple on paper. Secure a downed satellite containing sensitive technology before it fell into the wrong hands. But in practice, it was far from simple. We weren't alone out here. A team of mercenaries hired by some shadowy organization was hot on our heels. The mission turned into a deadly game of cat and mouse. Each move we made was countered. Each trail we left was followed. The Arctic didn't care who we were or what our mission was. The weather was harsh and unforgiving. Blizzards reduced visibility to almost zero. The bitter cold seeped into our bones no matter how much gear we wore. Our supplies dwindled faster than we anticipated. Every ration, every bullet, Every piece of equipment became a lifeline. We had been trained for situations like this. Survival, evasion, resistance, escape. The core principles of SEER training echoed in our minds. But it was more than just training. It was our sheer willpower and determination that kept us going. The mercenaries were relentless. They had the advantage of superior numbers and seemed to always be one step ahead. But we were SEALs. We were trained to fight it against the odds. We managed to locate the satellite in a remote ice cavern. The mercenaries descended upon us like a pack of wolves. Gunfire echoed off the icy walls, turning the cavern into a deadly echo chamber. We fought back, utilizing our training and the harsh environment to our advantage. Ice became cover, snow became a blinding weapon. The howling wind masked our movements. One by one, we neutralized the threat. With the enemy dealt with, we secured the satellite. It was a small victory, but a victory nonetheless. We were battered, exhausted, and still miles from our extraction point, but we had completed our mission. The journey back was a test of endurance. Our bodies screamed for rest, for warmth, but we knew we couldn't stop. Not yet. When the rescue chopper finally appeared on the horizon, it was the most beautiful sight I had ever seen. We were going home. As I sat in the chopper, looking out over the vast, unforgiving wilderness, I couldn't help but feel a sense of pride. We had faced the harshest conditions, a relentless enemy, and our own personal demons. But we had prevailed. We were SEALs, and we never left a mission incomplete. I lived in the tri-state area of Virginia. I had a lot of strange experiences in the woods that surrounded the property I grew up on. Now that I'm older, I'm just now realizing how weird these experiences are. Two of them stick out hardcore in my mind as super weird. My first experience, I was wandering in the woods across from my house. I loved going up there and doing and finding things like old bottles, rocks, and just whatever caught my attention, you know, dumb kid stuff. I however did notice the bones, multiple large piles of bones. I just figured that some hunter had just left the carcasses out in the woods. It was turning dark, and I was heading back home, but I heard something behind me whispering my name. The voice was raspy and sounds broken in a weird way. I started running back in the direction of the house. Sound of footsteps followed me to the edge of the woods. A road ran in between my house and the woods. I turned around and looked back. I saw what looked like a dark shadow darting back into the woods. The second one is much more scary to me as I was older and remember it much more clearly. It was late at night. My mom wasn't home at this as she was at a party and was going to be hanging out there for a few days that summer break. It was the middle of the night I had been spending it on the computer watching YouTube. 
I had gotten up to get something from the kitchen to drink. As I was coming back, I heard my pet bloodhound scratching and howling on the outside of the door to be let in. Our house was fenced in, so when she needed to go out, I'd just let her out and close the door, waiting for her to scratch at it to be let back in. I hadn't remembered letting her out, but I figured I had just forgotten about it. As I was about to unlock and open the door, I heard growling from behind. I had let her out, but had let her back in just few hours ago before dark. She and the other dogs were standing behind me, growling at the door fully ready to attack what was on the other side. I noticed that the scratching had stopped, but the howling had distorted sounding more like broken version of it. I heard whatever was at the door run off. I tried to look out the window to see what was there. All I saw was two yellow glowing eyes staring back at me from those woods. Nowadays I would have chalked all this up to a vivid imagination, but I've never been able to imagine things as I have a Fantasia, so I have absolutely no clue to what this was. I figure it was a skinwalker, because I remember hearing that the local national park that would always pay actual Indians to travel up from, I think, Arizona to take part of the reenactment, but I don't know that's why I'm posting it here to see what you guys think. Although I no longer live here, mostly because of what happened, this experience has always stuck with me, and the near thought of it leads me to many sleepless nights. Not the scariest thing, but strikes me as out of the ordinary. I used to live in pretty much the middle of nowhere, in the corner of Wyoming, about two miles away from a town with a couple hundred people inhabiting it. My father had always been a very hard-working, self-disciplined man, and so he wanted me to be like him and he would always send me out to perform chores around our somewhat industrialized cabin. Nearby, within viewing distance, there was a poorly maintained walking trail near a river. We never really saw anyone walking it, and we weren't sure how it wasn't completely overgrown. This particular night, my father sent me out to water the garden, which was conveniently placed pretty far away from the house, just across the trail, and so I had left the house with the water, I am a pretty tough guy when facing animals other people and real life scares, but paranormal things have always shook me to my core. As I am traversing the lightly bushed plains, I spot a small, flickering light in the distance. At first I brush it off, but I soon realize that the light was moving closer to me, and it seemed to be going along the trail. I had never once seen anything other than the occasional squirrel travel that trail, but here the light came. I decided to crouch down behind a bush. Because around the area, most people weren't very friendly and usually had very little social interaction. First sense was sight, seeing the light. Then I began to hear thudding coming from the same direction. The thud became a gallop, and I immediately knew it was a horse. The place where I was may have been old-timey, but people didn't usually ride horses. As I am crouched in the bushes, only about age 12, I am scared to death. This is around 2 in the morning and nobody should be out, and nobody is ever really out in general around here. As the horse approached, it finally turned the bend, and I see a somewhat small, pretty young girl riding the horse. She was wearing an 1800s style faded green dress, a hat, and holding a torch. She was riding pretty fast, and had been looking back every couple seconds and screaming father, but since I knew it was a young lady, I decided to step out of the bushes and say hello, are you alright? I said. She sped up, even more. The horse seemed out of control, and she just sped past and she was gone as soon as she came. The torchlight faded out of sight, and I continued my journey to water the garden, hearing her screams for her father slowly get more quiet and fade into the darkness of the Wyoming forests. For some reason, little me didn't find it odd that a young girl was riding a horse alone in the pitch darkness of a Wyoming forest with an 1800 style dress and a torch at two in the morning in an area with pretty much no people. I was a dim child. When I arrived home, my dad was fast asleep, and so I decided to wait until the morning to tell him. When the morning arrived, I told him about the girl, and he said the exact same thing happened to him less than a decade ago. The same girl, same clothes, same torch, same horse, screaming father. What my dad said sent a shiver down my spine, and I will always remember the strange girl 
Probably a ghost riding past me in the middle of nowhere. Never heard of it. Again. But my childhood friend who was in the area did say that he remembers some sort of legend with something to do with a girl and a horse. But other than that, I have no idea what happened. Maybe I'll never know. I'm not sure what to call this thing. All I know is that it is nowhere near human. If I remember correctly, my first encounter with it was when I was around 10 or 12. I'm turning 20 in four days. It's all fuzzy. That's what I do remember is that at the time, I was we were one in the state of California, two playing hide and seek outside with a few of my friends for privacy's sake. We will just call them Ray and Finn. It was already pretty late. I'd say about 6.47 p.m. It was in the autumn, so sun was practically gone by this time. It was Ray's turn to seek me and Finn decided to run off together, since we both didn't really like the dark all that much. A phones with lights were still pretty expensive, so none of us had one. Only thing we had was one of those old shake lights that you have to shake to charge. Anyways, it had been about ten minutes since the round started. Ray got close, but never close enough to find us. It was funny for a bit until me and Finn heard it. It sounded like a low growl, like a wolf, but just deeper and more messed up kinda like it was sorta underwater. I remember when we heard it. We both yelled and ran out running to Ray. Ray. Oh, there you guys. Why do you guys look scared? At the moment, me and Finn were pretty scared and shaken up and we just wanted to get out of there. We kinda looked at each other in silence, then grabbed Ray by the shoulder and guided him out not daring to look back. And honestly, the only reason I didn't look back was because I swore I could hear it following us. We barely got any sleep that night, especially when the house was old, and just wouldn't stop making those creepy sounds you always hear at the worst times possible. I believe it was around 6.33 a.m. when I decided to try to get sleep. I went to wash my face off in the bathroom. I shit you not while washing my face. I saw it behind me. The only details I could get in that moment before I freaked out is that it had blood red eyes and its body was like pure black. At that point, I knew damn well that I wasn't going to be able to sleep. So I turned on the TV and just watched some cartoons for the rest of the day, trying to keep whatever I saw out of my head. Fast forward a week and we kind of have forgotten it. Already out in the forest playing the game once more. This time we were out till 7 or 7.25 p.m. It was around that time. I just held the shake light close making sure to keep it charged as I wandered around looking for Ray and Finn. But instead of finding them, I found it instead whatever the fit was. Because of how dark it was, and its black body I could barely make out any features. Didn't help that it was looming over a dead deer eating at the carcass. It didn't even care that it ate the bones as well. What I could make out with the light, and because of the blood, was that it had a reptilian-like jaw. Not like a snake or a lizard. Honestly, it was more like what you see on a dragon yet. Its teeth and the amount it had were just uncanny. I was frozen with fear for a bit, but when it realized I was there, I dropped the light and ran for my damn life, yelling for Ray and Finn to get out as well. I thought it was following me, but it was just Ray and Finn catching up to me. As we all ran inside, they tried to ask me what the EF happened, but I honestly was too scared to even talk just hugging them both glad that they made it out and away from that thing. I didn't get much sleep that night as well. Honestly, I'm surprised I got any sleep but now. I regret even laying down that night since when I woke up, I was in a paralysis-like state unable to move and struggling to breath. Whatever I saw in the forest was right at the foot of my bed, crouching down just to fit into my room, so it had to be at least eight feet, if not taller. The morning light kinda revealed that I was correct about the dragon-like face. Well, dragon mixed with a bit of wolf. I could kinda hear something dripping as it slowly inched up onto the bed. Umtros, I was scared shitless and completely immobile. It got right above my face, its mouth slightly open like it was going to eat me. It just sat there like that for eternity, but suddenly it lunged and I finally broke free and yelled. After a second of just screaming, I realized I was still alive and that my mother had come to check up on me. Seeing how scared I was, she ran over to make sure I was okay. All I could do was sit there shaking out of terror, and the only thing that anything had happened was a huge print on my bedsheets. 
It was kind of black like ink, but was quickly disappearing. From that day on, it just kept getting worse. I had horrific night terrors, constantly had sleep paralysis, where I would see him take many forms. Fast forward a half of a year, we hit our breaking point. Me, Ray and Finn are having a sleepover at my house, just playing Minecraft since it was still new, and we love building games. It was around 4.54 p.m. and dinner had just gotten done when we heard it. A loud thud on the roof that slowly became scratching as low demonic like growls followed the scratching. At this point, my dad has had enough and grabbed two guns asking Finn to follow, since he was the oldest out of us three. Fifteen, at the time almost sixteen. They went outside to see what the hell it was themselves and to see if they could kill it once for all. It kind of started to rain a bit when they went outside and me and Ray were not allowed near the door, since my dad didn't want it to be able to lung down and take us. But as a minute turned into almost twenty minutes, slowly hearing them get louder, and louder practically yelling at whatever it was. I was about to open the door when Ray pulled me away and I heard two gunshots, then three more as my dad is yelling screaming. After a moment he ran inside slamming the door, close and locking it just breathing heavily. Finn was nowhere to be seen, and we kinda just thought of the worst since dad did kinda have a bit of blood on him. His leg was sorta broken, as well. The bone was showing, almost made me puke on the spot. Dad is kind of fine now since he had an implant, but for Finn, we were right to think the worst. Because I recently learned that yes, Finn indeed died that day. They have yet to find his body and dad just has not been the same. The next day I had to say bye to Ray since dad just couldn't handle being in that house anymore and we moved all the way to Washington as soon as we could. We have been here since, but I think it followed us. On my late night walks, I can sometimes hear something following me and my dad just doesn't want me to talk about it. The only details I have gathered from my dad about the creature is that it's nine feet tall, has dragon-like wings, wolf dragon-like head, its body was dripping like ink tar, and it had spikes down its back. It's hard to talk to dad about any other details, because he's just gone down a road drinking. But honestly, I think it's back, and I'm scared. I don't want anyone to die again, and I don't want to move once more. And I get that I didn't really see it myself, but it still scars me and I still have sleep paralysis and nightmares about it. I am living very rural, in a small village, with maybe 10-15 houses, but close to the highway. You can drive there within maybe 5 minutes, and also about 10 minutes away from the town. If you cross the street, it just takes you about 10 minute walk to reach the forest. First Christmas Day. In the afternoon, my partner and I decided to go for a little digestive walk, as we were really stuffed from all the food. It was about 17 and already dark when we left, and we had a big and bright LED flashlight with us. I also took my camera and my flash, as I love taking pictures of nature at night. We decided to walk on a little country road towards the forest and then turn right, following a small graveled cycle track close to the forest border, which connects our village and the next maybe 15-20 minutes walk between villages. In the middle part of the track, you have to walk through a small bit of forest. It's rather dark and the trees are very high and quite dense. When we entered I saw our flashlight reflecting on something and recognized a car being parked there on the side of the track, close to the trees. This struck me as odd, as cars are not allowed to drive there and the path is very narrow and hidden, so I was a bit cautious. My partner pointed the light inside of the car, and it seemed to be empty. I also noticed the windows were frozen, so it must have been parking there for a while. A bit in front of the car, I spotted a tree with an intriguing structure, and I asked my partner to point the flashlight towards it, so I could focus better and photograph it with my flash. After I took a few images, my partner told me, Mm-hmm. There is someone standing behind us, in the middle of the road. He is looking at us. Nobody was following us the whole way. I kept looking around and behind us occasionally, because at this time in the evening and close to the border of the forest, there are boars sometimes in its mating season, so they are more aggressive than usual. Indeed, there was a man standing behind us, staying out of the flashlight's reach. He wasn't saying anything, just standing there and facing us. At first, I thought he might be startled, 
as it may seem a bit weird if someone's just taking photos around your car, was not even legal to drive on that path with the car. I decided to get up and confront him from a distance, explaining to him that I was just taking photos of that tree. He didn't react and still just stood there. I then went on to ask him if he needed some light, and he replied that this wasn't necessary. It was odd, but I was still calm, sure about there being a normal explanation for his behavior. Nonetheless, my partner and I decided to just get the F out and followed the path leading to the next village. It was maybe five, seven mine until we reached. I remembered the letters on his license plate, not the numbers though, unfortunately, and googled it. And it turned out that he was from a city about six away from our village. Mind you, the country I live in is in a very strict lockdown right now, so you are only allowed to travel even by car, if you have very urgent reasons. After we reached the first lantern of the next village, we looked back and observed the car driving a bit out of the forest, turning around, and going back inside. I was able to see that he parked there again, and turned the lights off. He didn't leave the forest. We then went home on a much longer way than initially intended, as I didn't want to go back there for obvious reasons. Our flashlight battery died on the way, and my phone battery was low, so I didn't want to call the police back then. But I called them as soon as I arrived home and gave them all the details big regret that I didn't memorize the whole license plate. But it was just so surprising that I seriously didn't think about it. Also, it only occurred to me as really strange when I thought about the frozen windows and that he could impossibly have walked behind us. Plus him having no light and not responding. He did seem to be sneaking up on us when I sat down to take the photo. I think I was very lucky to have my partner, the camera, and the bright light with me. I don't want to imagine what could have happened if I was alone. So, creepy guy sneaking around in the forest. Let's not meet. Edit. When I told my housemate, she theorized that he may have been spying on the houses very close to the forest border. As you can easily look into their backyards, without being seen you have to walk a bit up the hill and further, about five minutes. I think it's likely. I had the thought of photographing the car when I entered the forest part of the path, but somehow I felt unwell about it and decided to not do it, despite it being an interesting scene. In hindsight, I believe this saved me as he must have hidden behind the trees close to the car and forest entrance. If he was really planning a burglary, or worse, dumping a body. I think it's not unlikely he may have attacked me if he realized I had a potential photo of his car with a recognizable license plate. Thanks for listening. Hope you already fallen asleep. See you tomorrow at the same time.